Hi, and welcome to the 16th India Meet at Horasis. We're over here in Athens, and we have the pleasure of being with Raghav Podar, the chairman of Podar Education. Namaste. Namaste. Welcome, Raghav. Thank How you. How are you doing? Enjoying Athens? Lovely, lovely. Enjoying Athens and all the beauty of uh, the city and the beauty of the people and the big hearts that they have. Uh, have you walked around and checked out the schools yet? Uh, not the schools <laughs> yet. I've only checked out the Acropolis yet, but I'm waiting to see the schools. I mean, honestly, when it comes to history, I feel a lot of our history teachers uh, from the past, I, I can see yeah, their face uh, yeah. already as you see these buildings. Absolutely. Huh? And it's, I was speaking to somebody actually, a tour guide, and she yeah. was telling me that 50% uh, of the schools out here are private schools and 50% uh, are government schools, which is very, very similar to what India is because India has about the same ratio of private and public schools. That's incredible. So yeah. tell me something a little bit, tell me a bit of the history because Padar uh, Education, it's a multi-generational, uh, I wouldn't even say business, educational institute. So tell us a little bit about how it started, uh, a bit on the history please. So it's a long history, but uh, I'd say we are 97 years young and not old. Oh, very um, nice. So a century. Yes, almost, soon. almost a century. Yes, three years away and yeah. um, looking forward to the centenary celebrations. And um, I'm the fourth generation descendant. Uh, my great, great grandfather, Seth Anandi Lal Podar, started the first school in this suburb of Bombay, at that time it was a suburb hmm. uh, called Santa Cruz, which is okay. now <laughs> yes. the heart of Bombay. <laughs> yes. Um, not so suburban anymore. <laughs> not at all. And uh, he, along with Madan Mohan Malviya, uh, Sri Jamnalal Bajaj, and founder president Mahatma Gandhi started the trust <laughs> in August 1927. So it's. Uh, that is quite the history. It's quite a bit of history and a lot of legacy and big shoes to fill. So a lot of pressure wow. on my generation to live up to those ideals. Um, funny story, I must tell you that uh, we. Uh, how did I find out that Gandhiji was the first founder president of the trust? <laughs> yes. And uh, I tell these kids, I go to my schools and uh, visit and enter classrooms and I tell them, you know, I have these little primary kids, I have Gandhiji's autograph. And they, these <laughs> days, some days, they don't know autograph, they only yeah. know selfies, <laughs> yeah. these kids. Um, but it was interesting how we yeah. found out that um, Gandhiji was the first founder president. Yeah. And, I was going through these wedding albums of my grandparents uh, of the olden times. They used to have these photos, these black and white photos, and oh, they used to have these crepe papers between two photos, and you would carefully turn each page so oh, that. Oh, not the kind when you've got twenty thousand photos in your phone no, right now. No, no, and and you don't end up looking at them. And you don't end up looking at them. Exactly. Absolutely, absolutely. So going through those wedding albums, we suddenly find uh, that there's this this one piece of paper with some people's signature at the bottom, and. Yeah went to my grandfather and we are, I asked, you know, what is this paper? What is this? What is what it's about? And then he said, these are the first minutes of the meeting that was held in August 1927 <laughs> with these four founder trustees. And uh, amongst other things, one of the things I tell my uh, principals and head teachers that point number six the, on the minutes yeah. of the meeting was it was decided to appoint a headmaster at the princely sum of 150 rupees a month. <laughs> So I tell that to my principals every time they come and ask me yeah, for like a raise. <laughs> you're like, well, we can start again, you yeah, know. Uh, absolutely. How about this? <laughs> no, fantastic. And you know, education, it's really, you know, we've, we've had a long conversation uh, in, in these conferences about uncertainty, yeah. about, you know, geopolitical uncertainty, technology uncertainty, yeah. things changing so much. What is the role, and now the role of education, of educators, is more important than ever because Absolutely. it's almost a toolkit that uh, gets you ready. So tell me a bit more of your thinking. It's a great legacy. What do you see that future looking like for educational institutes so such as yourself? I think you had the nail on the head that a country's progress mm. is directly proportional to the quality of its education system, which yes. is directly proportional to the quality of its teachers. Mm. India, if we need to be spearheading the educational landscape of the world mm. or trying to be at the top, we need to attract the best minds, the best talent mm. of the country into the teaching profession. Yeah. It's as simple as that. Um, the unfortunate thing is that to invest in education, the returns on that is a long term. It's a longer. Yeah, it's a long so you game. find out the returns on investment which is 15, 20 years later. Yeah. But elections happen every five years. You're <laughs> judged over every five years. Yeah. So there's that dichotomy that happens, but I think the future is 
interesting, it's exciting. Of course, AI is this next big thing everyone's talking about. I remember yeah. I was doing an interview about five, six years, seven years ago, and they asked me that, you know, what's the latest big technology? Is it VR or is it AI? And mm -hmm. I was saying that, no, I don't think VR is going to be that cool. Yeah. It's just, yeah. it'll be cool, but that's it. But that's it, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. it's AI a flex. Has. Exactly, yeah. it's a flex. Yeah. AI is uh, something that probably is, it's going to change. It is already changing and yeah. I think, the way we define what is correct and what is wrong itself is changing. Yeah. Um, what was cheating when, say, mm. you or I were in school is very different from what is cheating now. For sure. Because if we looked at, say, textbooks, An encyclopedia, encyclopedia or, textbooks, or uh, anything and referred to that, it was considered wrong. Yeah. But today's kids, they already have Google on their fingertips and with yes. that access to limitless information. Exactly. By the time they're growing up, they're going to be auto-prompted with AI and other technologies yes. with the information that they need to complete their next task. Yeah. And yet as an education system, yeah. we're sitting and memorizing their... Uh, uh, history. The, exactly. Yeah. We're yeah. measuring their memorization and regurgitation. Yes. And they're We're just, testing the wrong thing. Exactly. Right. So to s define something as cheating, as the future of education is going to be that, that it's not about... In the 21st century, the world economy is not going to reward you for how much you know, but for what yeah. you can do, do with, with what, what you know, know, not for the amount the of knowledge that you have. Of how knowledge. you apply you, your knowledge, right. exactly. Right. But then I want to go back to one of the points that you raised, which is how important it is for educators, right, to get in the best talent as educators, because they're the ones propelling, yeah. uh, you know, we talk yeah. a lot about what's the skill set of the next generation, what's the skill set of educators Absolutely. that is going to be required, because that will change. To your point, if we are teaching our teachers how to teach students about memorizing and about that versus about uh, application, what are some of the changes that educational institutes and large ones such as yourself should think about when they're training the teachers? I think one of the most important things is to have lateral entry into education. So you yes. may have somebody who is an expert, a genius in their field, yeah. but because of the boards of education require schools or universities mm -hmm. to have the teacher to be a bachelor of education or mm. a masters of education and if they don't have that degree yeah. they are considered unskilled teachers but they're physics masters exactly they could be a nobel laureate yeah <laughs> but he, <laughs> he or she would be considered yeah. unskilled because they don't have the or MA degree yeah or whatever other degree it might be so i think that lateral entry to get the best minds, they're not necessarily going to go through the B and MA. Yeah. They could go through another path, but yeah. they are the ones who could inspire our children, yeah. who could light that spark of curiosity, yeah. inquiry, and yeah. inquisitiveness inside a child. And still that, uh, yeah. that, that curiosity, because yes. I think at the end of the day, learning is just about sparking that curiosity. Absolutely. If you can get a child passionate about what they want to learn, let that heuristic learning take place organically, and they will achieve far more than what instructional based learning what happens in schools today. That's really interesting because you're, from, from what it sounds like, is you're saying there's, we always talk about technology, but there's almost taking a human element Absolutely. Towards, uh, towards understanding and then applying that technology for the betterment of whatever uh, One, your, your metier is. 100%. Educational is an, education is not a transactional phenomenon. Yeah. It isn't about transacting curriculum. Yeah. The fundamental crux on what good education is based is mm. on the human relationship between a teacher and her learner. Yeah. If they have a good relationship, that is when the heuristic organic yeah. learning can take place yeah. and you spark that imagination, inquiry, curiosity inside a child. Yeah. That's all that's required. Yes. Um, if you don't, if you're not able to build that relationship with a student, with a learner, that quality of learning is going to be very poor. Absolutely. And I think that is where tech loses out. Yeah. It can't necessarily inspire. Tech does a very good job of delivering content. Yes. It knows more than any teacher can, no yeah. doubt. But it's a human teacher that inspires and sparks Motivates that curiosity. And unleashes exactly. the potential. Exactly. Absolutely. One hundred percent. That's that's incredible. And. You know, when we're, when we're thinking about that, what is the role in your view? Because we've spoken about educators, how they need to change. We've spoken about technology. We've spoken about students. What about in educational institutes? What about parents? Because parents play a very significant role in this. As an institute, you might want to change. Your educators are ready to change. The regulators might, uh, you know, also make a change happen. The students ready. But gee, there's an, a critical element of parents Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. And changing their mindset. 100%. The mindset change is the most important because mm. eventually if we want to, as an institute, 
propel holistic learning or mm. propel spiritual growth or yeah. making children of character and yeah. good citizens, leaders of the world and all of that we want to build. But the parent at the end of the day, how much did you get in maths? Yes, and absolutely. How much did you get yeah. in science? Yeah. What Why more? are you spending time outside praying? <laughs> exactly. And yeah. If that's what the mindset is, yes. I think we are anyways fighting a losing battle. Yeah. Um, and I think that also stems from the fact that what's the goalpost? If the For goalpost, sure. if what is the reason, why, why should parents send their children to school? Mm. So that the children can excel at what they are best in, maximize their inherent potential. Why mm. do parents send their children to school? So that they can get into the best college. College, yeah. That's not the same thing. Now, what do they need to get into the best college? The best marks. What do the marks measure? Memorization, regurgitation and yeah. rote learning for yeah. a large part. Yeah. So if the goalpost is about getting into the best college, which then gets you into the best job or whatever it is, hmm. if that's the goalpost, then you're not anyways measuring Changing the, mindset the holistic well. learning or the yeah. spiritual growth of children of good character and all of hmm. these things that we want to build in them hmm. or the 21st century skills of creativity and collaboration, hmm. critical thinking, mm -hmm. negotiation skills and all of that, leadership. Which of those skills are our test measuring? Absolutely. None. Absolutely. So that change really has to be a, a holistic, a very encompassing change. Yeah, 100%. And I think parents need to dive in also. Yes. Until we get parent support, because parents is the largest vote bank. I mean, there's no other vote bank than parents, yeah. because yeah. every parent is a voter. They're the actual customers. <laughs> They're the actual customers. Yeah. And they need to drive this rather than necessarily from a board of education or a ministry of education or even schools. Yeah. Um, it's them, the parents who have the large numbers and we need to, as, ed as institutes, as educators, educate them on what the benefits of this 21st yeah. century learning is as opposed to just memorization and regurgitation. Absolutely. And one final question and, you know, uh, and it could be as, uh, uh, you know, feel free to go into any ivory tower as you think uh, uh, of it. When we're talking, you know, right now we look at the education system. It is, you go to nursery, kindergarten, you've got your 12 years, you have your bachelor's, you have your master's, your PhD. With how quickly things are changing, does that system, do you think in the next decade, that structure of the system would still hold true? If yes, why? If no, um, why not? I think it will still hold true because I think change takes time. Yeah. It's very slow. Um, with, of course, with technology and AI, things are moving faster. And you do have um, some kids who drop out and still do wonderfully well. Yeah. But um, those are still anomalies. Those mm -hmm. are not necessarily um, a large number. I think most of the people still believe that that is the stepping stone to getting into yeah. the best company that they wish to get into or whatever profession that they want to. Yeah. So I think it's, in the, I, I personally don't think that much is going to change in the last, in the next 10 years of uh, the education system and the steps that we yeah. have to go through. Um, but with that, I think a lot more professions are coming up and yeah. um, which don't necessarily need these stepping stones. Uh, with the advent of new professions, yeah. um, those kinds of things um, will start becoming redundant of going right. through the the, the different the, courses right. yeah 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 fantastic and yeah. what about a final line for for people thinking about getting into education for future teachers thinking and wondering whether that's the right uh, career for them any words of advice for them do it because you're passionate uh, don't do it because you think it's an easier job mm -hmm. um, I've gone inside classrooms where um, these are full of Bachelor of Education aspirants and students and you ask them, you know, why did you choose this profession? Why do you want to become a teacher? And a lot of them will give answers like, you know, it's because, uh, you know, I got married and uh, my in-laws yeah. family said, you know, you know, why don't you spend some time in school? Spend some time with children. It's much easier <laughs> if you ask. Oh and I tell God. them it's not it's easy. Not easy. Yeah. The future of the country is in your hands, in your classroom, yeah. literally. Yeah. That's You're building the future every profession in this world is created by a teacher. That's how important your profession oh, is. So uh, be passionate about it and love what you do and don't think it's an easy job because other professions, maybe you work for six hours, eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours. A teacher is at least working in her mind 24 seven because she's thinking of her kids all the time. That is incredible. Yeah. Raghav, an absolute pleasure. Thank you Thank very much. Thank you so much. much. That was Raghav Podar. Thank you very much.